worship service, the front rows can come up and get theirs. I'm going to read scripture. Um, and I, I chose this. Tommy's going to share with us and bring his testimony. And we talked a little bit before worship. And uh, it really sounds like a powerful thing that God has done in his life. And um, so I chose this psalm because it speaks to our testimony. And I'm going to read from Psalm 66, uh, verses 16 through 20. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Tommy, we invite you to share your story. Should be on? Yeah. Sounds like it's on to me. I just came up front to get the candy. We'll let him fire up the PowerPoint and I could probably get started. Folks, my name's Tommy Scarless. I'm originally from Waterloo, Iowa, and uh, a friend of Joel's. Uh, we've been fishing together for years, and uh, he called me and uh, roped me into coming out here. He says, we would really like to have you come and be a guest speaker. And uh, I thought for a moment, I thought, man, I'm, I'm not worthy. I don't know if any of you have ever thought that, but you know, to, to stand in front of you and provide my testimony, um, I feel that I need to be humble when I do that. I feel that we need to be humble in everything that we do. And um, especially in a situation like this when I'm blessed with the opportunity to present with you, present to you my testimony. And uh, first of all is I want to ask you to forgive me. You know, I'm not a perfect man. I've lived a life that's not been perfect, and I certainly probably won't live a perfect life moving forward. And um, it's just a situation where, again, I want to I ask you for forgiveness. I think that's something that we all need to remember in all situations that love conquers all and um, forgiveness is I think the foundation of love so we've got a, a manual I give I'm gonna give her a sign back there that's the sign so I tried to tell my kids that I'm a Jedi but they don't believe that they've seen that before so I you know and I also I'm a I'm a work in progress the one thing that really sticks out over all of the lessons that I've learned and all the things I've heard is that God speaks to me like he probably speaks to a lot of you. Now, in my case, he doesn't say, Tommy, we really need to talk. I hear things or I think of things and I, I feel that that's God speaking to me. Years ago, I heard a radio program and they talked about leading by example. 
that God doesn't want us to go to work or go to church or go to the mall and whoever we run into. He doesn't want us to beat them over the head with a Bible. He wants me to lead by example, um, to be the first person to work, to be cheerful at work, to work hard, but get home in time to take care of my family. So that finally somebody that sees me at work, doing what I'm doing, seeing me smile, even in the darkest of times, says, what do you have that I don't have? That opportunity for them to stick their head in your cubicle, your tractor, your shop, your business, and, and, and see that example of here is a person that's happy, and I wonder why they're happy. I wonder why they're, they're acting like that. So I try to lead by example. I'm very blessed. I have to remind myself of that every day. Before my feet hit the ground, I'm laying in bed, and I, think to, I pray to God, I say, thank you for allowing me today to open my eyes, because look at what it looks like outside. It sure does beat the alternative if it was dark. If I don't do that, if I don't pray in the morning, if I don't thank God for allowing me to open my eyes, I get back in bed, <laughs> I pull the covers back over me. I try to be careful not to fall back asleep. But I pray again and I make sure that I'm thankful for waking up in the morning and be thankful for everything that I'm blessed with. Sometimes I try to do that before I ask for things. And I ask for a lot of things. But I am truly blessed. Um, luck. And I'll talk about this later too, about being lucky. Uh, run into a lot of parents. Well, you know, we got this one kid... Um, Guy, he's a lot of trouble. But our daughter, boy, we sure got lucky with her. You know, there's a lot of cliches about luck. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Um, I firmly believe in that. I firmly believe that parenting, my wife and I have worked hard. We're not, we're not doing a perfect job by any means, but we got these two little monsters here. They're quite a bit taller now and quite a bit more grown up than they are, but they, uh, they're a challenge. You know, we've read up, we've studied, we've gone through books, you know, and no book tells you the answers, but it might be able to help you. But we've prayed, help us raise these kids. And uh, we feel it's not luck. If these turn, two, two guys turn out to be good kids, we feel it's because we applied ourselves. There's a book I read once, and it says, if your worldly duties are keeping you from properly training and raising your children, you should give those duties back to the devil. And uh, with these two guys right here, in this instance, they had uh, been fighting or arguing. And so what I finally make them do is I have them sit, we have them sit on the couch and put their arms around each other and tell each other they love each other. These two boys, after about five or six of these slides today, are going to be very upset with me at the end of this service, but they'll get through it. But we, we tell them to look at each other, put their arms around each other, and tell each other, I love you. Sometimes those are the hardest three words that we can ever say to people. Forgive me are the hardest two. I love you are the hardest three. Uh, will you forgive me or I forgive you? Those are sometimes hard words to say, but we make them say I love you and, and remind them that this is the only brother that you've got. And both of them have to realize that because they are the only brothers that they have. And uh, we make them sit there with their arms around each other until finally they, they, that sunk in, we think, and we get through the luck. Next. I'd rather be lucky than good. And what I do for a living... Every once in a while, I'll get a fortuitous bounce. I'll catch a fish, and it's a big one. It'll be a lot bigger than the ones I'm fishing for. It'll catapult me to victory. I'll win the tournament. And some people may say, well, you got lucky with that one. He caught a lucky fish. Um, you know, once again, I think that we create our own luck. We create through hard work and through, most of all, through faith. I think that that happens. I'd prefer to be blessed. Um, it, plain and simple. If I'm going to rely on some superstition, if I'm going to have a, today is St. Patrick's Day, if I'm going to wait for a leprechaun to show up, I would just assume that I, I'm blessed. And you know what's interesting is that everything that I've ever asked for, within reason, I, I've pretty much gotten. Every time I've ever asked God for anything, I, I feel that as long as it's truthful and as long as it comes from my heart and he feels that I deserve it, I usually get it. And that includes our failures. That includes the things where I've made a mistake in life or I've crashed and burned. Um, there's a lesson within that and that's what I need to pay attention to and feel that I've been blessed 
with that situation. Most of all, I would prefer to be all three. Next. I would prefer to be lucky, blessed, and good. And I feel that that combination is what's really the foundation of what I do is most of all it's being blessed. Next. Um, God, my whole life I wanted to be a professional fisherman. That's what I do for a living. My neighbors think I load and unload my truck for a living, or my boat, but um, I wanted to grow up and I wanted to fish for a living. And you wouldn't believe the people, young and old, that come up to me and tell me that's what they want to do for a job. They'd love to have my job. When I'm washing the boat, they never show up. But they'd love to, oh, I'd love to have your job. And, you know, you, I, I love my job. Every day I think, man, I just truly, truly love my job. And I've gotten to the point in my career where, you know, I've got a lot of titles. Uh, I was named by Outdoor Life one of the top 20 anglers on the planet. Um, I've got more majors than anybody in walleye fishing. I've won a championship in walleye, or several, in walleyes. I've won a championship in crappies. I've got nicknames Mr. April, Mr. Erie for winning those tournaments. I've achieved everything and more that I ever dreamed of achieving. Next. Mr. Who? There's a lot of people that walked into this church or heard my name over the last couple of weeks or since Joel and I agreed that we're, I was going to come out and speak to y'all. And people are like, who? Tommy who? Who is he? And, uh, you know, that's, that's, my fame is somewhat limited. You know, it's, it's, it's semi-famous. But in the end, those titles, and I've learned that it really doesn't matter. I've got guys that I thought that once I got to the top or near the top of the walleye pile or the professional fishing pile, that they'd admire me and want to talk to me and be my buddies. And be honest with you, a lot of my fellow competitors, because I've won or they got second in that tournament or so, they hate me. I've also realized that winning, you win 150 grand or 60 grand, and you've got the trophy sitting next to you on the way home, and you're driving home, and the thought rolls through my heart, my mind, is this really all that's there? I mean, you go cash the check, the banker meets you there, they come and I've had them open the doors after hours. They want to get that money in the bank, right? And, it, and it's still, you look at that check, and it's like, is this, it's, is this all that there is to this? And um, I have to constantly remind myself that that really isn't that much, that there's much greater things in life than that. My favorite scripture is Mark 8, 36. For what does a man profit if he inherits the earth, yet he forfeits his soul? All those trophies are not going to help me get into heaven. All of those checks are not going to pay my way to friendship, aren't going to raise good kids. They can help. Money helps. But, you know, sometimes it, the more money I've had or the more successful I've been, the more I have to stop and put myself in check and say, be humble. Um, you win a tournament, and there was 140 people that finished below you that didn't win the tournament. There was 100 of those people that didn't cash a check. There was 50 to 100 of those people that are struggling and got to go home on a big credit card bill and might be fighting or arguing with their spouse. So I've got to constantly remind myself to be humble, and most of all, is it's just material goods. It's, it's really just money. I'll give you a coast through time and take you back to when I wasn't Tommy Scarless, when I wasn't exciting and enthusiastic, or at least I think I'm exciting and enthusiastic sometime. I was, I was just Tom Scarless. Um, I was a little guy. I graduated from high school, I think I was 5'9". Um, I was Big Bird in hockey. I had Boston Bruins socks and big black hockey pants and a jersey that was yellow, a practice jersey, and all the kids picked on me. They called me Big Bird. So my gross birth went like this, and then all of a sudden, I kind of stayed there until I graduated from high school, and then I grew up to be as tall as I am now. So any of you kids out there, if you feel too short in school, feel like you're not the big kid, feel like you're not the great athlete, you never know, man. Yeah, you know, I was short. I had a lot of coaches that came up to me. I exited 5'5", five five or I was a 5'5", five five as a junior, and then when I went into uh, 
senior, I got to be 5'9", and then I grew up to 6'3", and I ran into my basketball coach, or the one that I wanted to have as my basketball coach. Back when I was in high school, not everybody made the team. And I, did, I was one of those ones that didn't. I had no skill, no athletic ability, no confidence. And my coach looks up at me and says, Scarless, why didn't you go out for basketball? I said, I did. And you cut me. <laughs> but I lacked confidence. And I think that was the biggest thing. I didn't know that if I had confidence, that that was one of the keys to doing what I was going to do. I have such a sick sense of confidence I may pull off a good country song in the car or in the shower and think, man, I need to head right down to Nashville because I could become a country western superstar. Sometimes it gets me into trouble. But that confidence combined with the lack of faith. I had no confidence. I had no faith. And um, it all changed when I found it. How did I get this way? I, uh, I found my confidence. But most of all, next, I found out that you have to dance like nobody's listening. Um, There's some people that would be horrified to get up and speak in front of a crowd. I knew that I was going to probably have to do that if I was going to be a professional fisherman to give seminars. So I took every opportunity I could, whenever I walked by a mic, to get in front of it and try to talk. So I'd have that confidence. So one of my favorite mantras is dance like nobody's listening. You know, you got to... Just let it hang out there. We were coming here and my hair was a mess. I would wore a hat all day yesterday, got up early this morning. We were rushed to get here from Rochester. We drove about three hours. And my wife said, I got this, this dry uh, shampoo. And she sprayed, and I'm like, you know, I never tried this before. And I'm thinking, oh, we're driving in the car. I got it, you know. And it made my hair look incredibly wilder than it does now. And I'm like, wow, that didn't work. I know better than to try something new like that without trying it first. And uh, I said to Michelle, I says, you know what? I don't care. I don't care what I look like. I don't care if I have had Ed. I, I, I really don't care. Um, and uh, I think that's just due to the fact that it really doesn't matter what I look like to me. I'm, I'm going to act like this. I'm going to dance like nobody's listening. I'm going to let it out there next. And I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I learned confidence. I learned a lot of this stuff, too, from mentors in my life, people I'd run into. I was in the Bismarck Championship years ago. And it completely flopped. I made it to the big show, but I'm there in Bismarck, and Ron Linder comes up to me, and he says, this is Al Linder's brother now, famous fisherman. Scarlet, what do you, what do you got in the life well? Let, let me see. Oh, no, rats. They call little walleyes rats. Now, what, what place are you in? I said, oh, near the bottom. Ah, okay, okay. Well, hey, you could turn this into a positive. I need you to get the crowd. He owns the in-fisherman at the time which owns the professional walleye trail. So he tells me, he says, I I need you to get the crowd pumped up. Can you do that for me, Scarlet? Do you got it in you? And I thought, man, I, yeah, I can do it, Ron. And uh, another fellow come up, Chip Chip, uh, Porter, he's a writer. And I told him what my dilemma was. And he goes, you know what? When you get up on stage, all you got to do is yell, I love Bismarck Man Dan. So I get up on there. On stage, I love Bismarck Man Dan. And you know how many times I've done that? Because we had a lot of championships there, and then I ended up winning the big one there years later. Probably about 40 or 50, but every time I said it, the crowd went nuts because I told them I loved them. You know, I, got it, I brought it back to love and enthusiasm, and that really helped. And that from that point on, I constantly felt that I found confidence. And uh, most importantly, Ron Linder, Al Linder, all those guys, Big time Christians. And I'm thinking, well, they became professional fishermen. It works for them. Maybe it's going to work for me. So finding confidence, finding faith, a big deal with what I did. Next. To me, that was everything. That changed the whole thing. My faith in Christ. My faith that if I asked for it, and the confidence that God gave me to go get it, changed everything, changed my life in every angle, no matter what happens. If I can bring it back to that foundation, to me, that's the key. And you know what's crazy about it is, and I'll allude to this a couple of times later in this, in this talk, I forget that. 
I'll be sitting there with my wheels spinning. The car won't start. The battery's dead. I'm stuck in the mud. You know, however we get stuck in the mud, right? Because we all get stuck in the mud. And then I think, hey, dummy, pray. You know, don't keep God in a trunk like he's a spare tire and whip him out only when you... Have him out all the time. You know, in fact, have him sit next to you as a co-pilot. Wait, better yet, you get in the co-pilot seat, Scarless, and let God drive. And it's amazing what happens. But I forget that. I'll be stuck in the mud. The back car won't start. I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to pray. And it's incredible how many times I've turned the key and the car starts. Or all of a sudden we push one more time and the car gets out of the mud. And uh, to me, it, it's, it's changed my whole life. It's everything that I did. Um, how did I find it? You know, everything leads up to this. There's all these little things that direct you in the right way. That, that, that helped, me, helped me to find this. Cub Scouts uh, had a very, very religious, very wonderful lady that was our cub master, and I was learning to bang away on the piano. And you know how your kids, or you probably remember when you were a kid, you wanted to, I'd, wouldn't it be been great to just been a wonderful piano player? And uh, I have no musical talent whatsoever. Can't, I think I can sing, but I can't. But I learned how to play I Will Make You Fishers of Men. Um, on the piano, my my buddy Dale, her her son, he was kind of a kind of a rough tumble kid and kind of a troublemaker. He wanted to play "Smoking in the Boys' Room" on the piano, but for some reason or another, I I couldn't play that. But I could play "I Will Make You Fishers of Men." Next, uh, the Big Elm. I was a hunter and a fisher when I was young. We would, my mom and dad firmly believed that. Blackhawk County in Iowa has no salamanders because my brother and I extracted all of them, tortured them, and got rid of them. And I'm like, Mom, it's the, the environment's changed. It's, the salamanders are not gone because John and I might have tormented a couple of them. But I, I would trap a lot. And uh, the worst part about me trapping around the house is I usually got our house cat, Muffy. And uh, Muffy, we'd have to let her go, much to her dismay. And they were mostly live traps, so Muffy didn't get hurt on those instances. But I was sitting on a great big log one day, one night. It was windy. You ever notice, like, for the last couple of months, it just seems like it's windy every day. If it ain't snowing, it's windy. If it ain't windy, it's snowing, right? We're coming out of that, but it was windy that night. I'm sitting on this log that crossed this creek, and I had my hatchet, and I chopped out a big groove. I started to chop out this big groove, and... I went to wire a trap around this log, and I figured these raccoons crossing this log would get caught in that trap. And then all of a sudden, there was this sense of this is not the right place to put that trap. And I took a U-turn, I pulled the trap, I walked off the log, I got about 15 feet from it, and a huge, huge Chinese elm came down and landed and then folded back over and completely smashed that log into the creek. And it was at that moment that I had an epiphany. I said to myself, there was a reason that I changed my mind and got off that log. The big elm would have just completely, there would have been no way I would have gotten away from that, but I firmly believe, and every one of us in this audience, every one of you can think right now, I've had moments like that, I've had moments where I felt that there was divine intervention. And this was a big thing that really changed my life. Um, go ahead, next. My son and I, sons and I do a little bit of trapping now, and it sure is a lot of fun. But, it, you know, it's one of those things that where as I get older now, I just can't stand to, uh, to harvest animals like I used to be able to. I've, I'm becoming soft and, and much more kind and gentle in my old age. I still like to eat steak and chicken and stuff like that. Not into soy burgers, but uh, we have a lot of fun in the outdoors. You know, my, my religious upbringing, I was in the Greek Orthodox Church, and I was an altar boy, and I, that just meant that we would get into trouble. We, would, we were supposed to be serving the Lord, helping the priest as an altar boy. Um, it was something that our parents drug us to was church, me and my brother. I had a brother 18 months younger than me, and we fight way more than my two boys do. But uh, church was a, to, to me was a distraction. It was a reason I couldn't go hunting or fishing. And it was all Greek to me. They spoke in Greek. 
uh, 80, 90% of the service was in Greek. And I, you know, it's all Greek to me. I can't understand Greek. My grandmothers, uh, my great-grandmother spoke nothing but Greek. She could say, oh, Tommy, Tommy Moo, and Moo means my love. Tommy Moo's a nice boy. Little, girl, little lady, about four foot nothing. And what a, what a beautiful kind. We always said, if anybody's going to go to heaven, it's Grandmother Manolas. But her and my grandma, my great-grandma and my great-grandmother, dressed in black my entire childhood. And it's a Greek tradition to dress in black and mourn. They had lost their husbands. And when you went to a Greek funeral, it was the most tragic, dark, gloomy ceremony you've ever experienced. Has anybody in the crowd ever been to a Greek funeral? I wouldn't highly recommend it. I like the ones that are a celebration of life. I like the ones where it's acknowledging that we are going to join those that have gone to heaven before us and that we get to go there. Whoever we're celebrating gets to go there. So I didn't like church when I was little. Uh, Christmas, we were c &E boys. We went there during Christmas and Easter and it was a lot of fun. But I started attending other church functions and you know, a lot of those had very little adult supervision. We went on a ski trip once. We're up in this attic of this house where they let the church stay, the kids. And all of a sudden they started passing around this mason jar. They called it battery juice. Some kid got into his dad's bar and poured a little bit of liquor out of each bottle so he wouldn't get caught. And I'm thinking, this is a church function and I'm 14 years old. And uh, there was a kid in that thing that said, hey, let's, let's, let's get away from this. And it was interesting that that was the one time that I said that prayer. He says, I'm going to, I want you to say this prayer with me. I want you to pray with me. So to get away from the troublemakers, that was when I felt that I had been swooped away. And that's where we, I'd said the salvation prayer, where I'd asked Christ to come into my life. I didn't fully understand what I was doing at that time. But uh, next, it, it was the first time that I'd done it. Then from 18 to 25, woo, look out. When you want to, you know, when people say your sins will come back to haunt you, uh, I wouldn't say that they've truly done that physically, but mentally. Um, I was a pretty wild kid from 18 to 25. And uh, you could say that I lost my way. Next. But then all of a sudden I ran into Daryl and Sherry Christensen. Daryl Christensen was a prof professional walleye angler that was speaking at the Unidome. And his truck broke down. And I'm like, oh, Daryl, you know. Here's my chance to get him in a captive audience and I can give him a ride to and from their hotel and Daryl and Sherry Christensen got my truck and I found somebody to work on their truck and you know it was ironic that I was driving a pretty pretty new truck at the time and Daryl had this older Chevy and now I'm 53 and all my stuff has over 100,000 miles on it. I'd love to someday to be able to afford to get my wife a nice car but you know, we buy used cars. We save a little bit of money but Daryl, his car was broke down. I couldn't believe that a walleye pro Living and making all that money, living the dream, drove an, a busted down Chevy pickup truck or Chevy Spurban. And now I find myself doing the same thing. But that was an awesome moment because Sherry Christensen every morning would go and put these little books, these little testimonies, those little pamphlets that you see. And she's, she was great at putting those everywhere. And I'd drop them off at the Unidome. I'd go home and I'd have to clean out the truck. I'm like, oh, what is, it? What is this thing, you know? Uh, win the big one, find your way to Christ, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I ought to read these things. And it, it, it kind of nudged me and pushed me a little closer to God in that instance. And then probably the biggest thing that changed my life was Welch Village. I'd gone there on a ski trip. <clears throat> and I had taken a girl that, I don't know, I thought maybe we were going to get serious, maybe we wouldn't. I'm inside, it's 30 below outside, it's really cold. We're staying in this cabin with a bunch of other people. And she's out digging around in the truck. And I go out and I try, what are you doing? We got all the bags out. She goes, well, I, I don't want to tell you. You're going to get mad at me. I said, well, now I'm already mad at you. You know, you got to be honest with me. What's going on? And come to find out she had brought drugs with her. And I was devastated. I wanted to have nothing to do with that. And at that point, I didn't want to have anything to do with her. I went back inside the cabin. And uh, I prayed. I said to God, I says, God, I've been, I should just put this in your hands. I'm struggling. Will you bring me the girl for me? 
I'm tired of all the wrong girls. You know, of course, I told my sons when we were standing in the entryway, I said, boys, this is where you meet a nice girl in life. You won't meet a nice girl at the bars. You go to church, and this is where you'll meet nice girls. I was looking in the wrong spots. I never went to church. I probably would have found my wife a lot sooner. But it was incredible how I prayed that prayer, and I said, God, just bring me the girl for me. She doesn't have to be incredibly gorgeous. I'd like her to be cute. I've got, got to be attracted to her a little bit, right? And uh, she doesn't have to be a brain surgeon, but I'd like her to be, like her to be a little bit smart, you know? But I asked for the perfect girl for me. And it was incredible. I got done praying that prayer. My buddy says, dude, what are you going to do? And I says, I'm going to marry that girl right there. And my wife, Michelle, walked into the ski lodge. And from that point on, I was hooked. It was, it was love at first sight, proverbially. And what's interesting about that is, is that um, it wasn't very long after that that I had ran into a girl that, that liked me. And she owned horses and Harleys and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, and, and you, you sometimes question that. And I prayed, I says, God, are you sure that I'm with the woman that I need to be with? And he spoke to me crystal clear. He goes, son, not only did I give you everything you asked for and more, but I gave you the girl that I felt was perfect for you. It's incredible. Whenever I talk to God, he talks right back to me and I can hear him crystal clear. And I pray and I ask him, when you speak to me, God, let me hear it. In fact, make it so loud and so clear that an idiot like me can understand what you're saying. And he does. Sometimes he just literally smacks me upside the head with it, but I hear it. I went to Nelson Sports Center, Greg at the parts counter. It was tough for me to be out of town, but Greg was a huge believer, and we did a lot of talking. And a couple of the people that worked there, uh, two sisters, Danette and JoLynn, uh, visited with them a lot. And it was right at that time that my sister, Susan, I've got one brother that's younger than me, and I had a sister, Susan, that was older than me. Ten years my senior, taught me how to drive, was everything to me. Uh, she, she developed breast cancer at that time. And we were talking on the phone. I go, oh, what are we going to do? And she says, son, she, Tommy, she says, trust in, trust in God. Christ is going to get me through this and get us through this. And it was at that time that I think that I truly, truly got it. I was so close. And I was getting nudged that way and in that direction next. I took a trip to Big Stone, though. And I still didn't think I, I got it. Y'all you, you, probably go through this to where, okay, I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm lacking in faith and confidence. And I'm driving out to Big Stone with Carl Kaufman, an older man, a mentor of mine now, through my life, has always been there for me when I've needed him. But we were traveling out to a tournament. His partner had to stay in the Chicago area. My partner had to stay in the Chicago area. We're driving along, and Carl and I, you know, on an eight-hour, nine-hour drive, you talk a lot. I, I talk a lot anyway. But I asked Carl, I says, Carl, I said, can, can I ask God to show me that he exists? He said, sure. I said, can I ask for a sign? God, reveal yourself. He said, sure. So we prayed. And the prayer was, God, reveal yourself to Tommy so that he knows that you exist. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited for that sign. And you know, God, I believe, does it on his time. A year later, we were at Big Stone, same body of water. I was there with a different partner. He says, let's get ready for the rules meeting. I said, man, we got a lot of work to do. He says, there's a storm coming. You're not going to work in the boat. I said, no, the boat cover's on. I'm going to wiggle underneath the cover you know, back then I was 20-something, very new bind, very agile. I'm going to work underneath the boat cover. Let the rain hit it. It'll run off. You know, even if it's hail, I'll be okay. No, come on, man. I, he's, he convinced me to go to the rules meeting. While we're at the rules meeting, a tornado rips through the campground where we're at, takes one of the campers, and completely takes a quarter of a mile down the lake. Throws it right in the lake. Breaks oak trees that were this big. 
we're driving into the campgrounds and we're looking at the branches and the trees that are down. And I told Chad, I'm like, dude, this, this can't be good. And we'd heard that there'd been a tornado through. There were three big limbs on my boat. One big limb landed on my power source, my motor. One big limb landed on the trolling motor at the front of the boat, which is everything when you're fishing. You need that trolling motor to run the boat. And one big limb landed on the electronics and the console and the dash and all the gauges. Everything worked. It did a lot of superficial damage, scratched a lot of stuff, broke a lot of stuff, but it all still worked. It wasn't that broken. And I... I was horrified, and I prayed, and I says, God, this can't be the sign that I asked for, that you would do something like this. And I I, I couldn't believe it. And then the next thing you know, we go out to fish the tournament. After two days, we got a shot at it, but we got to roll the dice and leave the the easy money fish, the ones that are going to help us cash a check, and we roll out into the middle of the lake and we take a chance on these big females that hadn't come off of post-spawn yet. They just got done laying their eggs and they're all resting out there in the water. And we troll the lure by a fish. And we're, we're, we're out there with our planer boards in the water and I cross my arms and trying to figure out how we're going to win this tournament. I says, God, I says, now would be a good time for that sign. I know we need one big fish to win the tournament. And I get done praying and I look out and there's a planer board in the water. Planer boards are something you clip to your line, put them in the water, and they take your lure away from the boat so that you can run through the water like a combine instead of a two-row picker. You could spread out your fishing lures. And right at that moment, the board goes back. It's the biggest fish of the tournament. Chad reels it up, or I reel it up to the boat. Chad's got the net, my partner. I could see it's hooked barely by one little piece of skin on the lip. I go, we got one shot at it, Chad. I got that out of my mouth. The lure flies out of the fish, lands in the carpet. I'm looking at the lure stuck in the carpet. The fish is gone. The winning fish is gone, right? And I go and I lean against Chad for support and encouragement. And he goes, get off of me. I says, dude, I did everything I could. That wasn't my fault. He says, get off of me. I says, it wasn't my fault. He says, I got the fish in the net. He took a wild scoop, gets the biggest fish of the tournament. As it's swimming away, you can't even see it. We got a net with a 10-foot handle, and he scoops up the fish. We proceed to hug each other and jump around like two women that just won the showcase showdown on The Price is Right. (laughs) And people are looking at us like, what? There's a bunch of people that don't understand the levity of the situation. And we win the derby. And the fish weighs 6.16 pounds. Your, uh, your scripture that you read had 616 in it. We tie for the tournament, and the tiebreaker is the big basket. That fish anchored the biggest basket of the tournament. I win my first tournament on Big Stone. Ironically, to celebrate the victory, they put it on a tombstone. Big Stone is named for the granite that they harvest in that area. So my name's already on one tombstone. Let's hope that it's a long time before it's on another. Then I'm in, uh, I'm on a trip later on that year, and I'm getting fully solidified to believe that there is a God and that it is a son named Jesus Christ. And I end up watching Forrest Gump. I'm at a hotel in Cleveland, Ohio. And to make a long story short, this was a nasty hotel. But I'm watching Forrest Gump on TV. I just got done watching it. I had heard some voices talking. Long story short, there were, it was a conversation between some really bad people and the paper thin walls allowed me to hear just enough to be horrified about what they were talking about. And I'd watched right after that Forrest Gump and for some reason or other when I got done That's when I hit my knees and said, God, I can't do this without you. I need you to come into my life and take control of what I'm doing. I'm going to pray pray the prayer that I've heard a hundred times, and I need you to come into my life. And I don't know what to do after this point, but I just ask him, come be my guide, come save me. And it was incredible how I found that through a nasty hotel, and Forrest Gump was one of the catalysts that got done. Next. 
So I go on to the end fisherman. And I'm getting, I'm, I'm really relying on God a lot for what I do. And I'm relying on God a lot in my relationship. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm still far from perfect. I'm still an idiot on a lot of fronts. But Mark Dorn, huge Christian, runs the focus groups, invites me to lunch up at Brainerd, Minnesota. Knows I'm coming through, says stop by. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go to lunch with Mark Dorn. I'm, it's the power lunch, right? He's going to get me hooked up with some sponsors. They know that I'm an up-and-coming fishing star. I'm finally going to start being able to make a living doing this. You know? And, and he goes, the reason I invited you up here to go to lunch, I know you noticed you've been doing really good. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I wanted to, main reason is, I wanted to ask you, how's your faith? I'm like, what? So how's, how are you doing? How's your faith? How's your relationship with Christ? I'm like, it's okay. What about the sponsors? Oh, no, this wasn't about sponsors. I just wanted to, I was concerned about you, that God put it on my heart to talk to you. And, you know, and it, once again, it's one of these little nudges that reminds me that I'm doing the next, the right thing. Um, Al Linder and Ron Linder, again, constantly uh, guiding me, mentors. Here's guys I watched on TV that now I'm able to talk to all the time. But our conversations aren't about fishing. A lot of times with Al, our conversations are about Christ. Go to the focus meetings. Al Linder fills the focus meeting with people. A year later, I'm there. They ask me to do it. They got it on the radio. They got it on the TV. I do interviews. We, we pump it up. They advertise it. I'm thinking, well, Al Linder filled the room. I'll, I'll at least get like seven people. And when I agreed to do it, I told the guy that runs the focus, the Fellowship of Christian Anglers, I am not worthy to do this. I don't believe that I'm very far along in my walk to do this. He goes, you'll be perfect then because everybody else that's going to be in the crowd, they may feel that way too. I'm, but I'm, I'm like, I'm a struggling Christian at best. He goes, so am I. That's great. And three people showed up. But one person actually devoted their life to Christ. So to me, that was a big deal. And you got to remember that even just one person, these focus meetings were incredible. Sherry Christensen, who I said was with her husband, Daryl, and gave me a ride and put these little notes in there. I said to Sherry, I says, uh, Sherry, every time we have this focus meeting and they do the prayer at the end to accept Christ in your life, I go, is it okay to, I do that every time. Is that okay? And she looks at me and she goes, I do it every time too. I said, well, I've done it like probably 20 times. Is that okay? She goes, yeah. She goes, I've probably done it 20,000 times. I get back from that meeting. My buddies are like, man, you went to the Jesus Christer meeting again. You went to that, that meeting, those people. They went to the bar. I'm hanging out with my, my fishing buddies. And I went back into the room and I prayed and I said, God, how can I show them what it's like? How can I get my buddies? How can I lead them to you? How can I show them what it's like to be a Christian? And you know what God said to me? Maybe you ought to start acting like one when you're around them. Maybe you ought to watch your language. Maybe you shouldn't have so many beers the next time you go out with them. Maybe you should encourage them not to go. Try to bring them in, but start acting like a Christian. You're not going to ever convince them that that's the way to go if you're going to act like a heathen when you're around them. And it, it was crystal clear in my life what he was trying to tell me. Um, and now I got my kids, my sons, Jake and Nick. Every once in a while, a uh, word will tumble out of one of those cute little mouths. That I'm like, wow. And I asked one of them once, I said, where did you learn that word from? And they're like, Dad, I learned that from you. So I have to be a role model now. And it's, it's really, I think, has helped me a lot. You never really fully understand God, I don't believe, until you have children. Because then you realize how God feels about you. How God wants you to come to him and ask for things. How God wants you to behave. How God wants you to feel. I want my kids to thank me for being a great dad. I don't want them to always come up to me and ask for money. <laughs> and God's about the same way. And, uh, you know, when I have a bad day, I wrap my kids around me and my wife, and I feel that that is the blanket of love. That's going to be the one thing that, that can soothe me. And bigger than that is wrap God around me. In this tournament, we, uh, we were almost going to win. We were leading the tournament after two days. The Masters Walleye Circuit Championship, the one that I had wanted to fish for 
30 years and win for over 20, and here we got our shot at it, and we flounder the last day, and we fail, and my kids showed up, and I thought, well, you know, life ain't that bad. I got, I got all this. This is way better than a championship, the blanket of love. I read a lot of neat books. I keep trying to get my kids to read Farmer Boy, uh, Laura Ingalls Wild, Little House on the Prairie, watch television shows like I recorded all the uh, Mayberry shows, Andy Griffith, Opie. Kids won't watch them. <laughs> they don't even want to watch Chopped with me anymore. But I try to get them in front of good books. I really truly believe next that it's all about garbage in, garbage out. Books that I've read that have really helped me along the way, The Seeds of Greatness, it's an old book. Uh, Zig Ziglar, A View from the Top. Zig Ziglar's a huge motivational speaker. But deep within that, there's, there's a lot to do with faith and Christianity that, you know, the best part of all is you think about it, the golden rule. What would Jesus do? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And it's all in a lot of the books that I read. So I've gone back to read those again, and they've really helped me. Garbage in, garbage out. Try to pay attention to what our kids are reading, what our spouses are reading, what our grandparents are reading. But in this instance... One of the boys years ago had Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And man, I'm going to tell you what, I read that book and I'm like, I don't, I don't know if he's really going to learn anything good about this. In that book, it was all about trying to outsmart your parents. And I apologize. If there's any youngsters in here right now that think this is a cool book, I apologize. But, you know, when, you, when your brother has a band that's called The Wet Diaper and you're trying to fool your parents and trying to outsmart them all the time, I thought that, that one needs to be culled from the herd. We need to get him to read some good stuff. Now, um, and they've outgrown this at 13 and 15. Um, this was kind of a devotional or kind of a, uh, had lessons in it that every morning, every day, it was kind of a daily devotional. That's what's for breakfast now. That's what we try to get nutrition from and try to, try to move on with that next. Um, do any of you ever doubt? I get asked that a lot from my buddies. I get asked that a lot from people all the time. Do you ever doubt? Sure we do, right? My biggest answer to that is, my favorite answer to that is, I have witnessed far too many miracles to ever forget that God and Christ exist. Next. My sister Susan in 1999, I was telling you how in 94 we figured she had uh, gotten breast cancer. And in 99, she passed away. And I remember one morning getting woken up by my wife and she says, what is wrong with you? And I'm sitting there and I'm sobbing. To the point where I'm crying in my dream to where there's tears all over the pillow. I mean, literally streaming down from my face. And the dream that I had was my sister, who again was 10 years older than me, and I witnessed her in bed with cancer, with a bald head from the chemo, with a great big scar and a lump and a cyst that came out of her neck, it was, it was terrifying what my sister had to go through. And in my dream, she's laying in the hospital bed, I'm sitting next to it crying, and she rises out of the bed, and she says, honey, don't cry. She says, everything's gonna be okay. Her hair grew out in this dream, her clothes metamorphosized back into a beautiful spring dress, and there was my sister, Susan, that I had always known as this beautiful young lady, rising out of the, the deathbed, so to speak, and telling me that everything was going to be okay. And it was one of those dreams to where it wasn't a dream. I'll firmly convince you right now that she came back and told me that everything was going to be okay. Shortly thereafter, I run into a guy in a dock I don't have anybody to fish with me. I'm up at Little Bay to Knock, up in the Upper Peninsula. I ask him if he'll go fishing with me. He says, sure, we're out fishing. He shares with me he had just lost his son, who was another linesman. They were both father and son. In fact, he had two sons that were linesmen. And his son got, got killed in the linesman's accident. And I witnessed to him about God and Christ. He was a, a believer. But I told him about my dream with my sister. And I says, John... I bet you that there will be an instance to where you realize that your son's gone on to heaven and that someday you'll join him. 
So he calls me a year later. I'm driving up to the same boat ramp to meet him and pick him up. I called him. I told him, are you going to be on time? Because I am. And Yep. By the way, Tommy, I had one of them dreams you were talking about. I was out in the middle of the field walking. I saw this young man. I waved at him. It was my son. He walked up to me. I was crying, missing him. And he said, Dad, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. So I'm, I'm firmly convinced, Tommy, I had one of them dreams too. And it's moments like that where you, I get goosebumps thinking about stuff like that next, that that exists, that that happens. I've got a board of directors now that I surround myself with, Christian men that have shared with me when times get tough, I call them. You know, the biggest time I call them is when times are awesome. Tom Bruns, he'll tell me how to turn that awesomeness around and help Christ with a message with that. He'll give me a cue. Do this. Come on up and speak for our group. Tom Bruns has a construction company in Minnesota. He builds big highways. I mean, builds highways. Moves dirt from one spot to another. And then they come in and they pour the concrete. He's the one that sets up the off-ramps. A couple of years ago, he's telling me a story how they're on the edge of financial disaster. The state of Minnesota is suing him and telling him, you're not going to get paid if you do not get this project done on time. Sold his lake home, mortgaged his house, was putting everything he owned, his life savings on the line, to try to get ahead of the rain and build this highway. And they got a problem. They need sand for these overpasses. And his son Josh is out running a dozer in a, in a spot, digging out an area for the highway to go through. They had contracted a guy to bring this sand, and it was they're waiting on this guy, and it's holding up the job, and it's going to cost you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this sand moved to where they need it to and brought in from this other contractor. And Josh calls his dad and says, Dad, you're never going to believe this. I found sand. You know, the perfect construction job on a highway is where you find sand in one spot that you've got to move material out of, and you can use that sand to build an overpass or a highway in another spot. I'm trying to speak as intelligently as I can on this, so bear with me. But he calls his dad in a spot, he's telling his dad in a spot where there was not supposed to be any sand, Dad, I found sand. And you want to talk about a beautiful man, Tom Bruns, Christian, has led many people to God, been praying for, a, for God to come in and help him with this construction job, and Josh found sand. Found all the sand, got all the sand in the world we need, Dad, we can finish the job. One problem. They had signed a contract with this other gentleman for sand. So Tom calls the guy up on the phone and is going to figure out, try to figure out a way to get out of the contract and save the job. And the guy tells him, he says, Tom, I've been meaning to call you. Man, I'm, would it be a problem if, we, if I didn't deliver the sand for you and we negated the contract? Tom says, hallelujah, brother, you can keep your sand. I found sand. So Tom's on my board of directors. I call him and he helps me out along with Carl Kaufman, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go through two more things, and I'm almost going to wrap this up here. The protest. I've already won just about everything there is to win in walleye, maybe once, maybe twice. I'm in a big tournament out at Bismarck, Mandan again, going to win the championship again, running away with it. And I get, I get protested from some guys that, I don't really truly know what their motives were, but they accused me of something that I didn't do. And when you get protested for a tournament for cheating or something like that, this is the only time it's, it's ever happened in my career, I was devastated. I was so devastated that I, I couldn't even fish. And uh, luckily I drew a good co-angler the, ne the last, second to last day of the tournament. He caught all the fish, our bag counts together. He won the co-angler or the amateur division. I stayed in first place, fished the fourth day, and I'm just wrecked. I couldn't believe that this is happening to me. And I truly felt like I was being attacked. Uh, and I prayed to God that every night, but especially that night, how could you let these guys crucify me? And he said, easy with your verbiage, son. He says, I don't think that's the proper word to use in this situation. He says, you're being far from crucified. I thought, you know what, you're right. 
And uh, the big message was, is over the years, you've jumped to conclusions, Tom. You guys have talked in your little knitting circles. These anglers are, it's, it's, it's the worst little gossip circle you could ever see in some situations. But let he who is sinless cast the first stone. He said, what about the times you've done that? What about the times you've accused people and you didn't know what the truth was? And this is one of those situations. I ended up losing like three majors in less than a year. Total of about a quarter of a million dollars that I had right here I could have won. And it just, I blew it. And I just, I realized that those are instances to where I wasn't blessed for a reason. I wasn't given that for a reason. But I kept the confidence and the faith next to keep moving forward. Hastings. Uh, got my, my big old buddy here, Jeff Lahr. He's my partner in the walleye tour. He had just lost his wife. He uh, was on fire. We were praying all the time. We're, 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 he was praying all the time. We're on our way down the hill to Hastings. I said, Jeff, let's pray be- not from now on before every tournament. And I didn't know what would happen. I put my hand out, and he put his big old paw in mine, and we prayed. He had just lost his wife. Not long before that, tears were running down our eyes, and he looked up at me when we got done praying. He goes, I firmly believe we're going to win this tournament. I said, well, this isn't going to hurt. And we ended up winning that tournament. And ever since then, Jeff and I might get in a conflict as, as friends. We might be having a rough morning on the way to the tournament accusing each other not working hard enough or fishing hard enough or, and all of a sudden he'll put his big old paw out and I'll put my hand in his and everything just goes away everything gets healed next uh, ended up winning a championship the, uh, crappie national, the crappie masters national championship 200 boats from across the nation go down to Grenada, Mississippi to fish this deal and um Two Yankees, me and my partner Kyle Steinfeld went down. Next, ended up qualifying for it through a tournament out of Rathbun, which was one tournament. Miraculously got into the into the championship. Next, went down there, put out planer boards, Yankee tactics that they had never seen before, and end up just blowing it away, dominating the tournament to where we won the Crappie Masters National Championship. Next. For me, it turned out to be an opportunity to witness. When we were sitting there in the hot seats wondering if we had enough, I leaned over, took my hat off, and prayed and didn't realize I was doing it in front of about 400 people in the crowd. Just did what I do. You wouldn't believe the people that came up to me and said, I really appreciate your faith. And I'm like, what do you mean? We saw you pray before the final people weighed in. I said, yeah, I was praying pretty hard that they didn't have enough weight to win the tournament. And it's amazing, next, where we got back from that, I got a note from Kyle's mom. She said, thanks for bringing Kyle back to God. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, he told me all about the tournament and how you guys were praying. She goes, I appreciate that you led my son back to Christ. I didn't know that I had done that. I thought he was always there, but it was incredible. Ever since then, we're working on now, we've got focus meetings to where we actually get all the guys together at the crappie tournaments. Never happened before this to where we're actually praying before that. The final uh, sign in my life, October 2016 started out pretty good. Next, my partner and I got third in the Masters Walleye Circuit Championship. My shun, son got a really cool deer that year. Um, God, we have a lot of fun. The stuff that comes out of their mouths when you got them in a blind and you don't have the screens in front of them, the things they tell you, the things you talk about, having a captive audience in a duck blind or a deer blind, it's good stuff. So October was really, really good. Next. Ended up having a great crappie season that fall. Next. And then a moment that, once again, literally changed my life. I'm bow hunting. Now these photos are pretty graphic. I'm bow hunting. My stand breaks right after I'd climbed into it. I fall to the ground, get flipped midair, land on my head, and break my neck, completely shattering two vertebrae, uh, putting a ding in my spinal cord to where that isn't supposed to look like that. Two fellows beat me into the hospital. 
La Crosse. I got airlifted from Wakhan, 30 miles to La Crosse. Guess what that helicopter ride cost? That was 42000 My first helicopter ride, but I didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, I get there, and these other two gentlemen that broke their neck beat me into the hospital. So they got lined before me. And they were in worse shape than I was. So the surgeon came in. He said, son, he goes, I got good news and bad news for you. I said, what's that? He goes, we think we can fix you. We think we can put everything back together. Um, but uh, you're going to have to wait two days because these other two gentlemen uh, are going to get worked on first. And then we're going to work on you Tuesday. When I hit the ground, the pain was excruciating. My wife and my boys were right down the driveway my buddy Kyle heard me crash. I yell for help. I can hear him clinking around out in the driveway, getting his stand ready so he goes to go deer hunting. I yell for help, and all of a sudden this voice goes through my mind, hey man, what, what are you yelling for Kyle for? How come you're not yelling to me and asking me for help? So, oh dude, <laughs> you know, that's one of those oh dude moments with God, where, oh God, yeah, you're right. So I start praying, and at that moment, I know it's bad. I can't move my legs. I've got a burning sensation in my arms. If anybody has ever experienced nerve pain, fibromyalgia, it, it felt like I had hot irons pressed to my, my biceps, my triceps. And I'm like, God, I know this is bad. I know that I may...